the mid 19th century, industrial Britain was at full steam. The mills were producing an extraordinary volume of goods sold to British colonies around the world. Our power, our wealth, our global dominance was second to none. To celebrate the fact, in 1851, a great exhibition was held in Hyde Park in London, a chance for society folk and the solid Victorian middle class to marvel at the wonders of the new industrial age, the source of our prosperity. It all seemed so eminently civilized. And yet in these years, a constant whirring of doubt could be heard. Voices challenging this idea of British civilization. Newspaper editors, novelists, Christian activists, trade union leaders. They asked us to look beneath the gloss of prosperity, to focus on the suffering in the cities, in the factories. Was this the best our society could offer? Prosperity at a price? Or had the time come to reinvent what it meant to live in a civilized society? I want to tell the story now of a man, a really quite inspirational character, I think, one of those who led the movement in this country to create the basic conditions of civilized human life. He was a Bradford man, he was a mill owner, and his name, rather wonderfully, was Titus Salt. Salt, the son of a wool merchant, had gone into business in 1829, making worsted cloth from the fleece of alpacas, a kind of Peruvian llama, and he prospered. By the late 1840s, he owned five mills. He was the major employer in Bradford. In today's terms, he was a multimillionaire. The trouble was, Salt could see all too clearly the connection between his prosperity and the suffering of others. Bradford in those days was notorious as the most polluted of the northern mill towns. A yellow smog suffocated the city, causing dreadful bronchial and pneumatic problems. Life expectancy was the lowest in the country. Seven out of ten of the children of workers' families in Bradford died before they were 16. And Titus Salt surveyed this grim reality, and he resolved to do something about it. At his own expense, Salt installed a new kind of boiler in his mills that cut pollution to a minimum. Delighted with the result, he went to all the other mill owners in Bradford and urged them for the common good to do the same. But they refused. The common good be damned, the boilers would cost too much. And they returned to the worship of the great god, Prophet. I think Titus Salt was profoundly shocked by the behavior of the Bradford mill owners. And this experience of society out of joint, it changed the direction of his life. He sold his mills in Bradford. He pulled his entire fortune out of the city. He bought a larger plot of land further north on the banks of the River Eyre, and there he set to work, building not just a factory, but an entire industrial community, village and all, to house his four and a half thousand employees. It's the most extraordinary place, Saltaire, it's called. He named it after himself. Terrace after terrace of tidy, solid workers' houses, all arranged on a grid, with the streets all named after members of Salt's own family. And in this perfectly controlled environment, with all the power of an old-fashioned lord of the manor, Salt was able to play out a fantasy, almost, a vision, his vision of a perfect human society. It's not to everyone's taste. It reflects the values of a 19th century Christian philanthropist. There were schools and lecture halls and churches in Saltaire, but no offies or beer shops. Salt didn't approve. He wasn't offering frivolity, but he was offering, he thought, something better, dignity. 
a world in which everyone, employer and employee alike, could earn respect for a hard day's work, where profit would be earned not through exploitation, but mutual endeavor. Here in the mill, Salt's workers had a fair wage, reasonable hours, security of employment. The mill had smoke-consuming boilers, it had the latest fire safety equipment. It was built, of course, on a massive scale to house the machines, but the vast windows of plate glass allowed for light and ventilation. Here at last was industry with a human face. Apparently that chimney there is based on the bell tower of an Italian church, the Santa Maria Gloriosa, a little bit of Venice here in Yorkshire. Now that kind of detail cost money, but Salt believed he was making an investment in people. He thought he'd make his return when his workers turned up for work, not shuffling along, staring at the pavement, the drudges of the early industrial period, but proud, heads held high. And that vision of a new kind of relationship between capital and labor, it offered a divided nation hope. Titus Salt died an inspiration, but he wasn't unique. His was just one voice amongst many from all classes of society, men and women demanding change, pricking the conscience of the nation. And slowly but surely, we all took notice. Ideas once radical became the norm. Prosperity, yes, but not at any price. And before Salt died, laws had been passed, improving conditions in the factories, clamping down on child labor, tackling pollution. Workers won the right to join unions. Working men, at least, got the vote. And we moved, as it seemed, upstream to a more compassionate age.